Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar organized by the registered uh, team of uh, uh, the team of registered dietitians at Dairy Farmers of Canada. Today's webinar is entitled "New Insights on the Role of Milk Products in the Prevention of Type 2 Diabetes." My name is Isabel Niederer, and I'm the Director of Nutrition and Research at Dairy Farmers of Canada. And I would like to thank you all for attending today uh, from across the country. Pour les personnes qui parlent français, notez que la présentation est offerte en traduction simultanée. La présentation sera en anglais, cependant, alors si vous souhaitez l'écouter euh, dans la version originale, vous avez simplement à cliquer sur l'option « Langue anglaise » en haut de la page à droite. Uh, before we get to the, the actual webinar, we have a bit of housekeeping to do. So, uh, Dr. Hanley's presentation will last 45 minutes and will be followed by a question period. Through the uh, presentation, though, uh, you can submit your questions using the box below the video, uh, and we will try to address as many questions as possible uh, after the presentation. Before leaving the webinar, you can also download the presentation by clicking on the link at the bottom of the video. I'll now have the pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Anthony Hanley. Dr. Hanley received his PhD in epidemiology in 2000 from the University of Toronto. He went on to complete a postdoctorate fellowship at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center in San Antonio. From 2002 to 2005, he was a research scientist at the Leadership Sinai um, Center for Diabetes at Mount uh, Sinai Hospital in Toronto. And since 2005, he has been a faculty member at the, uh, in the Department of Nutritional Sciences at the University of Toronto, where he teaches, conducts research, and supervises graduate uh, students. Dr. Henley's research interest includes the metabolic and nutritional epidemiology of type 2 diabetes and its underlying uh, physiolo physiological traits, including obesity, insulin resistance, and pancreatic beta cell dysfunction. So it is my pleasure to turn it over now to Dr. Hanley. Thank you very much, Isabel, for the kind introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to all of you across the country. Uh, as mentioned by Isabel, I'm going to address today in my talk um, uh, new insights around dairy products and the prevention of type 2 diabetes. So the focus is really on, on prevention, uh, events that occur prior to the onset of diabetes, and not on management per se, but many of the issues we'll be covering do have relevance to the management of people that have diabetes. These are my disclosures. Um, much of this relates to funding for my research program and review work I do for different uh, funding agencies. So our learning objectives today are to gain a better understanding of the role of milk products in the prevention of type 2 diabetes. We'll try to learn uh, about new and emerging evidence on the role of milk products in the prevention of type 2 diabetes and acquire some insights that may be uh, applicable uh, in your daily practice. And so with that in mind, the outline will cover the following issues. We'll look at the current prevalence or, or burden of type 2 diabetes around the world and in Canada. We'll review the risk factors for the development of type 2 diabetes, uh, as well as the scientific evidence on the role of milk products in the prevention of type 2 diabetes. As well, we'll explore some potential mechanisms that may be behind the role of milk products in preventing diabetes, and we'll pay particular attention to a couple of issues, namely dairy fats as well as fermented dairy foods. So let's first take a look at the current prevalence of type 2 diabetes. So this picture is from the International Diabetes Federation Atlas. Um, this agency publishes a, an atlas of diabetes every couple of years. This is the most recent edition. And as you can see from the numbers on this screen, 
There's lots of diabetes around the world today, and the numbers are projected to get worse uh, over the next several decades. What's notable here is that the greatest increases are projected to occur in low and middle income countries. And so South America and Central America, Africa, North Africa and the Middle East, as well as Southeast Asia and other countries that have a similar socioeconomic and development profile. These are data from Canada, and you can see two things happening in this slide. The purple line uh, shows prevalence, which has been increasing over time from the, the slide stops at 2014, but you can see that across that period, the prevalence increased from 2003 to 2014. What's also interesting on this slide is the blue line. That is the, the line showing incidence, and incidence is a measure of new disease entering the population. So prevalence is the amount of disease at any one time. Incidence is the amount of new disease. And you can see that the blue line is flattening off or declining slightly. And in fact, we're seeing this uh, in a number of regions around the world. In fact, there was a, a paper published yesterday in the Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology Journal that shows data from several developed countries that are, are seeing the same phenomenon. Incidence is lower, is leveling off or perhaps lowering. Now, that doesn't mean we've, we've cured diabetes because the prevalence rates are still going up. We're getting better at, at keeping people with diabetes alive for longer periods of time. And there's still a lot of new disease entering the population. So diabetes isn't going anywhere. It's gonna be with us for a while. But the, there, there are a few slivers of promising information regarding the leveling off of incidence. Now, as we saw from the global picture a couple of slides ago, diabetes impacts certain groups more than others. These are data from the province of Ontario, uh, administrative data from uh, the Institute of Clinical Evaluative Sciences, which is a large research group here in Toronto. And you can see that compared to uh, whites in Ontario, those of, of African and South Asian origin have a, a much higher prevalence of type 2 diabetes. Now, th this slide is a, is, is a little bit old. It's from, from 2013. And what the paper showed, and I'm not showing on this slide uh, for, 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 for time constraint purposes, the incidence rates were very steep for the Chinese population of Ontario. So if we were to repeat this study today, the rates for Chinese Ontarians would probably be much higher. So again, the take home message here is that diabetes impacts racialized populations and marginalized populations much more than, than, uh, than white populations. Now, my, my work for, for several decades, much of my work has been in partnership with Indigenous communities. Some of you may work uh, with Indigenous communities or in Indigenous partnerships. Diabetes uh, affects this population uh, with a tremendous uh, burden. The rates are three to five times higher than the general population. The peak onset of, of diabetes is two to three decades earlier than in the general population. We see high rates of diabetes in pregnancy, both gestational diabetes and, and pre-existing diabetes in the context of pregnancy. This leads to an intergenerational cycle of diabetes where we see younger and younger people getting diabetes, which again feeds uh, young moms whose pregnancies are characterized by diabetes. And the cycle carries on on this basis. Because there are all these extra years of exposure to the diabetes milieu, uh, the onset of complications occurs much earlier in this population. And so you see very tragic events, including uh, a dialysis onset uh, among people in their 30s and 40s. All of this really relates to a very complex uh, legacy of colonialism and colonial policies that have played a large role in this phenomenon. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that we're getting better at keeping people with diabetes healthy and alive, and that's very true. We've made tremendous advances clinically uh, in the management of diabetes and diabetes education. Uh, although it's not all a rosy picture, this slide shows some data from the CDC in the United States. 
Uh, and they documented around 2008, after decades of declining rates of diabetes complications, there was an uptick in several of the major complications of diabetes. And as all of you know, 2008 was the onset of the most recent prior to this economic crisis from the pandemic. In 2008, there was an economic crisis. A lot of people lost their jobs in the United States. A lot of people lost their health care. And that's one hypothesis for why these complications are, are, are increasing. The, the, the victories were, were turning around, if you will. So what are the take home points from this section of the talk? Well, we do have a little bit of good news in that in some regions of the world, particularly westernized countries, there's a plateauing or a leveling off of the incidence of diabetes. However, we're not out of the woods. The global prevalence is projected to increase uh, um, in very significant ways over the coming decades, as you saw from the Global Diabetes Atlas. And diabetes affects disproportionately higher risk groups. So low and middle income countries, marginalized populations, racialized populations. And we're seeing uh, whenever there's economic strain or, or other changes uh, uh, in um, the broader environment, complications can, can uh, show resurgence. Let's move now to talk about risk factors for the development of type 2 diabetes. Now, before we do that, let's uh, just review very briefly the underlying pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. This is a very complex uh, condition that evolves over many years of, or decades, and it involves two major pathophysiological disorders, insulin resistance at the level of the muscle and the liver and the adipose tissue, combined with beta cell dysfunction, which is the uh, inability of the beta cells of the pancreas to produce enough insulin to overcome this worsening insulin resistance. Now, what's very interesting is that many, many years and even decades prior to the clinical diagnosis of diabetes based on elevated blood glucose levels, these phenomena have been uh, worsening uh, uh, over this time period prior to diagnosis maybe 10 or even 20 years prior to diagnosis. Insulin resistance gets worse, beta cell dysfunction gets worse, and we can document this many years prior to the onset of diabetes. And so from a research perspective, it creates an opportunity to understand early events that eventually lead to the onset of diabetes. Some very, very exciting uh, things happening in the scientific literature around diabetes and other cardiometabolic diseases. Uh, and I'll show you one or two here. We'll, we'll revisit these a little bit later in the talk. We're learning a lot about the gut. And everybody on this webinar knows that uh, in, our, in our guts, there are uh, millions and millions and millions of little organisms that live with us in uh, symbiotic relationships. The makeup uh, and the distribution and the relative abundances of these little organisms are very, very important on many levels to our, our health uh, as uh, entire organisms. So we'll talk a little bit later about the gut microbiome and the potential role that dairy may play. There's also a lot of, of work being done on the so-called gut-brain axis, the degree to which the gut and the brain communicate. This has implications for appetite regulation and also for mental health. We know, for example, that people with diabetes uh, have higher rates of depression, uh, have higher, higher rates of other mental health disorders. And there are many potential reasons behind that, but this gut-brain axis may help us to understand that phenomenon better. So this is slide is just an overview briefly of, of the uh, schematic of how diabetes involve, evolves over time. We have a number of modifiable and non-modifiable -modif factors at work these lead to the early phenomena, the early phenotypes of intra-abdominal fat, of ectopic fat, and by that I mean fat getting into places where it, it shouldn't be, the liver, the muscle, etc. cetera. Um, and then this leads to inflammation, uh, increases in insulin resistance and beta cell function, leading to prediabetes and eventually type 2 diabetes. Now, what do we mean by non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors? 
well, there are certain things that we can't do anything about that are, are known risk factors for type 2 diabetes. Age, ethnicity, family history of diabetes. We know, for example, that there are replicable genetic markers now uh, for risk of type 2 diabetes. Many of these relate to beta cell development and function. But there are many, many modifiable risk factors for the development of type 2 diabetes. We're learning, for example, a lot about early life or developmental phenomena. Uh, we, we used to focus our, our studies on uh, the decades prior to the onset of diabetes in adulthood, but really the, the risk factors can emerge very, very early. Gestational diabetes, infant feeding practices, the intrauterine environment, all of these appear to be very important in contributing to risk uh, or protection from eventual chronic disease such as type 2 diabetes. But there are many lifestyle and social factors that are also very important. Among these uh, are a range of dietary factors. Now, as nutrition professionals, you've probably all had the frustration of seeing a news story uh, and the angry response to that news story on social media about a recent study of diet and chronic disease. And so the, the, the nutrition field sometimes is portrayed as not knowing what it's talking about because of the reporting of inconsistent results. I think this is an unfortunate oversimplification because if you look at the collectivity of the evidence on various topics, we have a pretty solid signal that certain dietary factors are associated with increased risk of type 2 diabetes and others are associated with decreased risk. For example, we know that diets that are higher in glycemic index and glycemic load, that are higher, that, that have high consumption of sugar sweetened beverages and red and processed meat, there are many studies that have uh, uh, documented increased risk of diabetes for those that are at the highest levels of consumption of these foods. In contrast, we have many foods that are associated with decreased risk. Plant-based diets uh, conceptualized different ways, plant proteins, vegan diets, et cetera. High fiber and, and uh, higher proportions of whole grain foods. Uh, adherence to various healthy diet patterns, DASH, Mediterranean, the alternate healthy eating index, et cetera. And increasingly, we're seeing replicable evidence that the consumption of a, of a range of dairy products is inversely associated with the risk of diabetes. And so we'll talk about that now. Uh, before we do that, here's a summary of the previous section. Our take home points are the following. The pathophysiology of diabetes involves disorders in multiple systems. And these disorders evolve over many years or decades prior to the onset of diabetes. There are numerous risk factors that, uh, that uh, play a part at various stages of the evolution, and several of these are modifiable, which makes them amenable to prevention or treatment. In that context, diet and nutrition, we're learning a tremendous amount about uh, uh, those, the role those factors play, uh, and we'll now talk about dairy products in that context. So before we look at the, the studies, I'm going to take a few slides to just review the different ways that scientists generate the evidence to help us understand the link between dietary factors and outcomes. And so this is done a number of different ways. And so if you look at the, the scientific literature, you'll see a, a wide range of different kinds of studies, different angles of inquiry for how we understand the role of any food or any exposure, if you will, on a health outcome. We have basic or mechanistic studies, and, and these uh, uh, can exist across a range uh, of different study designs, cell cultures, animal models of, of different kinds, ranging from zebrafish uh, and, and uh, nematodes all the way to large animals. Typically, we see rats and mice used in these kinds of studies. And then there are different kinds of human studies that contribute evidence. And we'll talk a little bit in the next slides about observational studies and randomized control trials. So what do we mean by those two different kinds of studies? So observational studies, in those, in those kinds of studies, and, and by, by observational I mean case control studies, cohort studies, 
those are the best known of the observational designs. Participants are observed in the natural state. So exposure and exposures and outcomes are very carefully measured and people are followed over time to assess outcomes. These types of studies are typically longer uh, in duration and larger in number than randomized control trials. And this provides the advantage of being able to look at hard outcomes like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, etc. However, they are limited uh, by a number of, of potential constraints, including the potential for confounding. In other words, other variables that you haven't measured or haven't or have measured poorly um, um, getting in the way of your understanding of the exposure with the outcome. Now, in contrast, randomized trials uh, differ in, number, in a number of ways. Potential risk or protective factors are randomly assigned to participants. And so rather than just measuring them, people get assigned various treatments. That randomization can overcome to a large degree the problem of confounding that we have in observational studies. And on that basis, trials are, are considered the strongest of the human study designs in terms of evidence generation. However, they're typically shorter in duration and smaller um, uh, than observational studies. And that's because they're expensive to do, they're intense for the participants. And so very rarely do we see trials, um, particularly in human nutrition studies that have hard outcomes. Usually they're looking at intermediate phenotypes like blood biomarkers. Additionally, participants are usually very highly selected, those that are, are, are eligible for trial studies. We also have a number of very important issues around the measurement of diet. Human diet, particularly in a free living state, is a very noisy measurement, and I'm going to talk about that concept in a second. Let's first remind ourselves about the main ways that we measure dietary intake in human studies. We have 24-hour recalls, diet records, food frequency questionnaires, and biochemical measures. These are the four main approaches, either individually or increasingly we're seeing combinations of methods and, and variations on these methods used in observational studies. Because trials assign foods or nutrients to participants, we don't see these methods used as much, although they are used sometimes to monitor compliance. So what are the, the things to keep in mind about these, these different ways of measuring diet? Each approach has strengths and limitations. So 24-hour recalls and records are very good at capturing the entirety of intake on a previous day or over a, a short window of days. Recent intake uh, over a, a short period of time is very well captured, including absolute intakes of important phenomena like total energy. However, these methods are reliant on memory and training in the case of records and recalls. And for that reason, they're very time consuming, intensive for the participants and very expensive to do in very large studies. They're also limited in that to get a picture of usual dietary intake over a long window of time, which is what we're usually interested in, in terms of an exposure for chronic disease, you need many, many, many of these to get a picture of usual intake because human diet has a large amount of day-to-day -day variation. Food frequency questionnaires were designed to overcome that problem by being able to provide a picture of usual diet over a longer period of time. And for that reason, they're efficient for large cohort studies. However, they're not very good at assessing absolute intake of things like energy and they are subject to misclassification because they don't capture every single food that a person may eat on a given day. Now, biochemical measures offer some advantages, and so biomarkers is another way to think about this, um, overcome some of these limitations um, because they have distinct properties in capturing um, in capturing some of these some of these uh, issues that are missed by the other methods. However, we actually have very few biochemical measures that are uh, uh, available for foods and nutrients. And there's some question about the duration in which they actually capture usual intake. Also, um, uh, they're very complex to, to um, uh, assess in human populations and there are issues around analysis.
So why did I take the time to talk about these issues? Those problems that we have, those challenges that we have in measuring human diet, <clears throat> excuse me, have consequences for the interpretation of the studies that come out. The, the, whenever you have a, a, a measure in a human study that's difficult to capture with accuracy and precision, it means that measurement has a large amount of noise relative to the signal. And so what that, that's sometimes called misclassification. And what that does is it dilutes the measures of association. And so whereas a true relative risk between an exposure and an outcome may be five, with the white noise, that measurement can be diluted down much lower to say 1.5. So this is one of the reasons we get this problem in the nutrition literature of inconsistent results across different studies. I'm gonna show you an example of that in this next slide, but before we do that, let's just orient ourselves to what's happening. This is, a, this is an example of a meta-analysis. And so all those rows that we see are individual cohort studies, in this case, looking at glycemic index with the incidence of type two diabetes. Down below in the large open diamond, you see the summary relative risk. And so that has resulted from an analysis of all these different cohort studies to get a sense of when you put all these data together, what is the summary message from all these studies together? Now, the point of this slide, we're going to talk about meta-analysis in a moment, but the point of this slide is to show you that the quality of your dietary measure matters. In the top part of this slide, we see um, cohort studies that have used food frequency questionnaires that had a very poor correlation with the gold standard for assessing glycemic index. And you can see that the measure of association between glycemic index and the incidence of diabetes was non-significant. Down below in the bottom half of the slide, we see studies that used much better food frequency questionnaires that were designed and validated to properly capture glycemic index. And in contrast to what's going on in the top of the slide, these studies, when they are summarized, show a significant positive relationship with the incidence of type 2 diabetes. So the quality of the measurement matters in terms of how we capture diet in human studies. We talked a little bit already about meta-analyses. These approaches have a, very, a number of very important advantages in understanding the collection of evidence. Often in a news broadcast uh, or on social media, people talk about one study. Science is never about one single study. You have to take the entirety of the evidence on a topic uh, and evaluate the new study in the context of what's been done before. Meta-analysis allows you to systematically do that by including all the evidence in a very transparent way. The methods and the, the statistics around meta-analysis are, are improving all the time, and we're really uh, uh, making some significant advancements in the science of meta-analysis and in understanding large bodies of data. Of course, the disadvantages are that, that that if the studies themselves that go into the meta-analysis have limitations, these are carried forward into the meta-analysis itself. In terms of recent developments in meta-analysis, two slides ago I showed you a classic example of a meta-analysis in which individual cohort studies were meta-analyzed together. People have now taken this a step further by doing pooled analyses. I'll show you one later umbrella reviews of meta-analyses, which are meta-analyses of meta-analyses, and then overviews of meta-analyses, which present the individual estimates together. And I've got examples of, of uh, an overview in a couple of slides later on. There's a very good paper by Alvarez Bueno that um, provides a overview of systematic reviews on dairy product consumption and diabetes that I would refer you to. So let's actually look at the data. What, what, are we, what do we have from recent meta-analyses of observational studies in the context of, of the incidence or the onset of type 2 diabetes? So this is the most recently published meta-analysis. There have been several published over the last decade or so, and I'll show you one or two of these. This is the most recent, looking at a meta-analysis of 21 cohort studies 
And this meta-analysis compares high versus low intake. And when you roll all of these together, so first of all, the, the, the little um, red boxes are the point estimate from the individual cohort study. Those lines on either side are the confidence interval. And that vertical line represents, which is right over the one on the x-axis, is the unity value or the, the, the line of, of no association. And then what you can see at the bottom of this slide from the diamond is um, the, the summary relative risk, which is 0.91 with a confidence interval that does not overlap one. And this tells us that there is an inverse or, or protective association between the consumption of total dairy and the incidence of type 2 diabetes. When we look at the data a different way, uh, this is a dose response plot, uh, which asks the question, is there some optimal amount of total dairy to consume? Is there some inflection point? And they actually systematically tested this by doing a linearity statistic. And because that p-value is not significant, they weren't able to say that there's significant nonlinearity here. But what you can see is that the steepest part of the line is really up to about 500 grams per day and then it levels off. Again, this will be different across different meta-analyses, and the confidence bounds at very, very high dairy intakes get quite wide because the data are sparser in that part of the distribution. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, all of the data are below the risk level, uh, 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 below one indicating inverse relationship or protective relationship. Um, so this is... Uh, uh, another uh, meta-analysis looking at total dairy from from the year before. Again, the same message uh, that that in this in this particular case they looked at at not high versus low, but um, intake per 200 grams per day, and the the relative risk summary relative risk was below one. The co upper confidence bound included one, so not statistically significant, but 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 inversely related with type two diabetes. Now, the advantage of the Alvarez Bueno paper was that they took all of the published meta-analyses over the last 10 or 15 years and showed them together in a figure. And this is what we're looking at on this slide here. So these, these uh, forest plots are not individual cohort studies, but rather they're the results of meta-analyses on the same topic. And as you can see in the top part of this figure, um, which compares high versus low dairy intake, all of the meta-analyses except one show a s significant inverse relationship uh, between a total dairy intake and the risk of type 2 diabetes onset. If you do the analysis a little bit differently and look at per unit intake, either 400 or 200 grams, the story is, is essentially the same. The vast majority of the data points to an inverse relationship of dairy with uh, diabetes onset. Now, importantly, that was total dairy. What do the studies that break down the products according to high versus low fat and dairy subtypes? These are also, this is also a figure from the Alvarez Bueno paper uh, that is providing an overview of meta-analyses. And you can see that for low fat dairy, the signal is pretty clear consistent inverse relationships across different meta-analyses with the onset of diabetes. The story for high-fat dairy is a little less clear. All of those point estimates are either on the unity line or below the unity line, although the confidence intervals uh, overlap that line, indicating no statistical significance, uh, although no signal of harm uh, either. Um, now, when we look at milk and cheese uh, separately, you can see uh, that for, for both of those individual dairy foods, the milk is shown on the top. All the meta-analyses are, are, have point estimates below one indicating inverse relationships, and all but two of those are statistically significant, and the story is, is fundamental, fundamentally the same regarding cheese. I'm not going to talk about other dairy subtypes. You can look at these papers and, and the data are available for you to look at. There's an interesting sort of curious story about ice cream uh, being inversely related to the risk of type 2 diabetes. 
I would interpret this cautiously because as you can see from this slide, most of those data come from uh, the uh, Harvard cohorts, which use the same FFQ, the same kind of a population has got into those studies. And so really, uh, I think we need to be cautious about ice cream, although it is uh, uh, cautiously encouraging as well uh, in, in terms of what the data thus far are showing us. Now, everything I've talked about up to this point has been from um, cohort studies, observational cohort studies. And for you know time limitations, we don't we can't get into the very complicated area of randomized control trials. But I'll sh I'll show you one, and I'll talk about one more. So this is a very good meta analysis of randomized controlled trials from uh, a group at Laval University in Quebec City. They looked at 38 trials, and they found something interesting: that that um, um, elevated versus minimal intake of dairy products in the context of a trial there was a slight and statistically significant increase in fasting glucose when you put all those studies together. And yet A1C, which is a measure of longer term glycemic control, the relationship was in the other direction. So there was a significant inverse uh, or reduction uh, in A1C when you put all these studies together. And not, not the, the studies didn't include all of the same measures, uh, yet, um, uh, there were at least 500 people that, that generated this observation for A1C. Now, in this meta-analysis, the relationships with insulin-based measures of insulin resistance were not significant, although there is another recent meta-analysis um, published in Nutrients in 2019, which showed a significant inverse relationship. So what are our take-home points? Um, the prospective cohort studies uh, are pretty consistent in in indicating an inverse, um, i.e. protective, or at the very least neutral relationship between total dairy intake and risk of type 2 diabetes. For many of these subtypes, the story is the same. Inverse or neutral relationships, particularly with low-fat dairy, with milk, and with cheese. I'm going to talk about yogurt a little bit later. The randomized controlled trials are more complicated. The results are mixed in some cases. But one has to keep in mind that there's tremendous heterogeneity in these trials in terms of the amount of dairy, the outcomes being measured, the matrix in which the dairy has been delivered, the follow-up duration, et cetera. Uh, these are, are very, very complex types of studies to meta-analyze meta together given the heterogeneity. So what mechanisms may be at work um, in helping us to understand the relationship between dairy intake and type 2 diabetes? Um, dairy is an a, a enormously complex matrix containing water, carbohydrates, fat, protein, vitamins, and minerals, all existing within a very complicated matrix that uh, is influenced by processing, homogenization, fermentation, and a range of probiotic uh, uh, aspects. We'll talk a little bit about some of these going forward. There's a very nice paper from a few years ago, published by Dr. Mozafarian from Tufts University, in which he provides an overview of the different mechanisms that emerge from dairy components and their, their different processing elements that uh, impact the different pathways that we know are very important uh, in determining cardiometabolic disease. We don't have time to get into all of these today, uh, but uh, this is a very comprehensive article uh, if you're interested in taking a deeper dive on this topic. So just some take-home points again from this section. Dairy products are a complex matrix included in, in the context of micronutrients, macronutrients, and various bioactive components, all existing within a complex matrix. And many, many of these elements have been shown to have a um, potentially important impact on numerous pathways that are relevant to type 2 diabetes etiology. Inflammation, insulin resistance, beta cell function, adipose tissue health, uh, to name a few. In the last few minutes, we'll talk a little bit about some new and emerging evidence regarding dairy fatty acids and fermented dairy foods. So much of the work I've been involved in from the perspective of dairy has been around dairy fatty acids. 
And the dairy is a, is a complex matrix, even when you take a deeper dive into some of the macro and micronutrients. And so you can see that the fat profile of dairy is very complex. It, it, it includes saturated fatty acids, um, which get the most attention, um, but that in itself is a complicated issue, which we'll talk about, polyunsaturates, monounsaturates, and naturally occurring trans. Now, what's interesting is that many of the fats that we consume within dairy products, we also make ourselves. And so if you measure human circulation, you'll find fatty acids that may largely have been endogenously produced within the human subject, him or herself. But what's interesting about dairy products is that there are some fatty acids that can be detected in human serum, which probably reflect the consumption of dairy products because these are entirely exogenous. They're not made by humans. And there's a list of them here on this slide. I won't read the list to you. You've heard about many of these, I'm sure, including the pentadecanoic acid, 15O, as well as probably transpalmitoleic acid, as well as 911 CLA. And so because these fatty acids are exogenous, they give us a couple of advantages. The, the most obvious is that they provide putative biomarkers to help us understand and stratify study participants in terms of, of the consumption of dairy products. What's important though, and what is covered in that Mosafarian paper, is that, that it, a few or many of these fatty acids may have important bioactive roles to play. And so I won't get into this in great detail, but we know, for example, that 911 CLA has been shown to uh, improve insulin sensitivity and reduce inflammation. The um, odd chain saturates 15O and 17O may um, be, have a beneficial impact on, on fat physiology and transpalmitoleic acid similarly has been shown to improve insulin sensitivity. In my own work, we've been working um, um, on some of these questions in a study called PROMISE, which is a longitudinal cohort study in which we measure participants frequently with very detailed um, protocols to assess longitudinal changes in insulin sensitivity and beta cell function before the onset of diabetes. And so we're trying to take advantage of this window before people get diabetes to understand the influences on the trajectory of these early disorders. Now, what's interesting is that, that these fatty acids that we consume from dairy products live in different places within the human serum. And so, um, um, in collaboration with my colleague uh, in, in nutritional sciences at U of T, Richard Bazinet, his lab is able to break these down into the finer comp compartments, including phospholipids, triglycerides, cholesterol esters, and um, uh, NIFA, or free fatty acids. And in fact, when you look at where these exogenous fatty acids exist within that breakdown of the different plasma pools, the amounts are not the same, and that's illustrated on the left side uh, of this figure. Um, on the right side, we see a heat map. The most important, important take-home message of the heat map is that, that while most of the fatty acids correlate with each other across the different pools, the triglyceride pool seems to behave differently. And that's very important in that the um, as a measure of intake, so if you're going to use these fatty acids of, as biomarkers of intake, the phospholipid and cholesterol ester fractions correlated quite nicely with reported dairy intake in this cohort, whereas triglyceride and NIFA did not. This is work, by the way, by my former PhD student, Ingrid Santorin. Ingrid went and looked at the phospholipid pool in terms of these dairy-derived fatty acids, uh, in relation to progression over time of, in insulin resistance and beta cell function, and she found they were beneficially associated with how these traits evolved uh, over a period of six years. Now, these uh, fatty acids, um, uh, specifically the three listed on this slide, have been, have been analyzed together in a global effort called the FORCE Consortium, which is a pooled meta-analysis of these fatty acid data from different studies. And as you can see here, there's quite a strong inverse relationship between higher concentrations of these fatty acids together or individually, 
with the onset of type 2 diabetes. And so again, same story as the intake data. These biomarkers of dairy intake are inversely related to the onset of type 2 diabetes. Um, because we're running out of time, I'm not going to talk about branch chain fatty acids. This is a new area that, that is emerging in the literature and my group is getting into. We can talk about those later if you're really interested. Um, um, very limited data right now, but potentially very promising in, in helping us to understand the link between dairy products and the onset of diabetes. I want to finish by, by having a few slides on fermented dairy foods. Now, I showed you the cheese meta-analysis data. This is from, again, the Alvarez Bueno overview meta-analysis. Again, these are all data from different meta-analyses, not different cohort studies, but, but they're all rolled together onto one slide. And you can see there's a remarkably consistent signal of significant inverse relationship of higher yogurt intake with lower risk of type 2 diabetes. So there's a lot of work going on right now to understand why that might be the case. And there's, there's a number of different pathways uh, that, that, that may be playing a role. But, but one thing that scientists are very excited about is the potential impact on the gut microbiota. And I mentioned that a little bit earlier in this talk. So the, the activity in the scientific literature regarding the gut microbiome is tremendous. And a good place to start, this is a figure from a very nice review article from a few years ago that's cited on this slide. A good place to start is to understand that there are marked differences in the composition, the relative abundance of different species um, in obese versus non-obese individuals. And when you look at what these different <clears throat> um, relative abundances do in terms of physiological impact, some of it is quite important in the context of downstream effects on diabetes and other cardiometabolic diseases. The obese microbiome phenotype uh, uh, results in um, leaky gut, uh, to use uh, uh, a layman's term, which allows toxins like lipopolysaccharide to leak out of the gut into the systemic circulation, which it's thought to set off a cascade of inflammation, de novo lipogenesis, ectopic fat deposition, uh, and really may be one of the early things that, that, that starts the cascade of cardiometabolic disorders. There are other aspects to this obese microbiome phenotype, including uh, enhanced nutrient harvesting, um, short chain fatty acid uh, uh, production differences, uh, a range of, of, of issues that, that uh, probably have importance for what we're talking about. So our take home points from this section, dairy fats, um, uh, this is a, an area of intense study. At the very least, they're gonna provide us with novel biomarkers of dairy intake in human studies, but there's some exciting work happening regarding mechanism in terms of various diabetes pathways. We just talked about fermented dairy, um, uh, very consistent evidence, particularly for yogurt. I also showed you the cheese data. And there's a range of ways that fermented dairy may be beneficial. Uh, we talked about the microbiome, but that's really just the tip of the iceberg on potential mechanisms. This is a very quickly moving and evolving literature, um, um, but potentially very important in the context of the link between nutrition and chronic disease. My last slide, um, just to summarize everything we've talked about over the past 45 minutes, uh, cohort studies are giving us a very consistent signal of at the very least neutral and, and probably inverse associations between the consumption of dairy products in total as well as specific subtypes on the incidence of type 2 diabetes. The trial data are more complicated to interpret for a range of reasons and we really do need um, more and better trials to help us understand the impact of various dairy products on some of the phenomena we're interested in in, rela in relation to chronic disease risk. Many, many potential mechanisms that relate to dairy itself, its matrix, its components, and some of the processing and fermentation aspects that may uh, impart health benefits. Just to thank my, uh, my funders, my colleagues, the students that have worked on some of this work, and I wanna thank you for your time and attention.
Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Hanley, for, uh, for your presentation. Uh, I'm sure it will go a long way in helping uh, people uh, uh, advance their knowledge on this important issue. So we'll now turn to the question period. So there you go. Um, we did receive a fair amount of uh, a question that referred to how many uh, servings um, of dairy products per day would be beneficial. Yes. And so that's an excellent question. And, you know, truthfully, that's a difficult question to answer from the cohort data, because when you think back to how the questions are answered on the food frequency questionnaire, people are asked usually, um, uh, what, what is your usual consumption over uh, uh, the past three months or the past year of different dairy products specified in a certain serving size? And so, the ability of these kinds of studies to exactly break down um, the precise um, servings per day that impart benefit at an inflection point is challenging. What is What was interesting about that, that dose response meta-analysis that I showed you was that when you put all of the, dairy, the different uh, studies together, there was a, quite a, a marked um, reduction in risk up to about 500 grams per day, recognizing that that's all products rolled together uh, with, um, and then a slight leveling off after that. And so we could cautiously say that, that 500 grams per day in its totality seems to be where the action is. There's another study that has uh, the, the GIJPER study that, that looked at some linear dose response relationships for some specific dairy products. This, th those um, plots are buried in the supplemental data of that paper. They, those figures tell a little bit more of a linear story. And so, so in other words, there doesn't seem to be a flattening out after, after 500 grams. And so I think the answer to that question, Isabel, is going to be best answered by carefully done trials where we are able to really get some insight into uh, uh, granular insight into the, the issue of, of servings per day. Okay. So the next question is, uh, in the studies that you presented, uh, which show that uh, yogurt is associated with a reduced risk, was yogurt sweetened or plain or both? And can you provide some insights on that? Yes, certainly. And, and so the for a couple of reasons, um, the meta-analyses rolled all yogurts together. And so that yog any any data line that was presented regarding yogurt would be everything, would be um, sweetened yogurts, would be unsweetened yogurts, would be yogurts of different fat um, um, uh, uh, composition, Greek, et cetera. Uh, and the reason for that is that in, in it, it again traces back to how the question was asked in the food frequency questionnaire. Some of these FFQs are going to ask relatively simple questions about yogurt consumption. Others, particularly in countries where there is a richer tradition of fermented dairy consumption, will ask a finer breakdown of, of different yogurt types. However, the, the mechanism of rolling all the studies together in the context of a meta-analysis means that the researchers have to collapse these, these um, data down into simpler categories. The other problem is that many of these FFQs were designed at a time where we weren't, um, we, we, we didn't have the evolution of uh, the yogurt the, the range of yogurt products that we have today. And so they're capturing, they're asking simpler questions about yogurt consumption. The good news, Isabel, is that that, um, that phenomenon of all of these things of different types and fat contents and sugar contents being rolled together, even with that noisy measurement, the yogurt signal is really the strongest of all of the dairy products. It seems that whatever you put in there, dairy, uh, yogurt again and again has this consistent inverse association with, with, uh, um, with the onset of diabetes and certainly other chronic disease outcomes.
Interesting. So we received a question that is uh, outside the subject of this webinar, but I feel it's important uh, to address it because there's been a, a lot of attention uh, on this subject recently. So the question is, uh, I hear that cows are fed palmitic acid supplements. Uh, what what uh, can we provide uh, in terms of information on what this is all about? Uh, uh, what this is uh, all about and what are the impacts on milk? And maybe I can take that question, <laughs> Dr. Henley. Yes, please. Uh, so I think it's important to realize that cow's diet can differ uh, through the country uh, based on soil conditions, climate, uh, weather patterns, and, and what crops grow best in, in different parts of the country. And that the exact feed rations that are uh, given to cow that are determined at each farm is, is done in uh, consultation with veterinarians and animal nutrition experts who uh, look at the best diet to uh, meet the, uh, the, the needs of the cows at, the, at, at a particular moment. So farmers really work closely with uh, cow nutrition experts to adjust their cow's diets to provide them the best diet to meet their particular needs at a, per, a particular period of their life or lactation stages. And so at times a fat supplement rich in palmitic acid is given to a cow in a very targeted way and in limited amounts uh, as a supplement to her diet when she may uh, uh, be falling in negative energy balance uh, in order to, to fill her uh, higher energy needs, particularly at the beginning of her, of her lactation state, uh, for instance. Uh, and I'm sure uh, participants on this webinar are aware that palmitic acid is a fatty acid that naturally occurs uh, in plants and, and animals at various levels. It, and it naturally occurs in the dairy fat and makes up about a quarter of the uh, of dairy fat. And the cow produces palmitic acid naturally, more or less depending on uh, on what she eats. Uh, and, and also it's important to realize that uh, the level of palmitic acid in, in dairy fat fluctuates naturally uh, within an expected range as a result of, of many factors, uh, including what the, the, the cow uh, eats. And uh, we've... Uh, We've analyzed, we analyze routinely the fatty acid profile of, of milk and we do not have any indication at the moment of any increase in the proportion of palmitic acid in the past year or so beyond what would normally be expected. So uh, supplements of palmitic acid are given to cows at time in, in, in amounts that are uh, typically small. Uh, and this has a very modest impact on the palmitic acid profile of their milk. It's estimated from, from our analysis that uh, the increase uh, in palmitic acid content of, of dairy fat that is associated with the way it is uh, in the proportions that it is given to cows here uh, is in uh, the range of less than 3%. So that covers this topic. Let's move on to another question. Um, what further research uh, you would like to, to do on dairy products and type 2 diabetes? What would be your dream, uh, dream research at this time? Well, uh, Isabel, I think, I think we really need to um, move the evidence into my work is almost entirely in observational work and, and I, observational studies are very valuable and contribute important information as an important part of the puzzle. But because we are now at a point where we have lots of cohort studies, we have the meta-analyzed meta and the, the, the uh, signal from those studies is now relatively consistent. At the same time, we have controversy around a number of things including saturated fat, in some cases added sugars into dairy products. The, 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 the public health urgency, if you will, the clinical urgency is to have high quality trials to really ask some of these important questions in terms of outcomes. The trial colleagues that I have are um, uh, stressed because 
research funding in Canada is is right now is 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 a challenge, and to really um, produce the evidence that we need, you need to have large enough trials that that generate evidence on hard outcomes, and so really it's a matter of of the political will, if you will. Um, to to form these large trials, maybe it's consortia work or maybe it's funding from different sources to really answer these questions definitively in a way where the rigors of a trial, particularly randomization, allows us to, to put some of these lingering questions to bed because the faith that I have uh, in, in cohort evidence, I think is well-founded up to a point, but I do recognize that that there will there will be things that cohort studies will never be able to answer because of the uh, potential for residual confounding. And so, so good quality scientific evidence. If we don't have that, then we're we're going to be swimming around with angry people on social media. The evidence gap provides a very frightening window for. Um, for snake oil and for charlatanism, and we've seen how this can happen politically. Uh, so, so the the rigors of scientific evidence they move slowly, sometimes frustratingly so. But at the end of the day, that's where the truth lies. Very good. I couldn't agree. Couldn't agree more. So, unfortunately, that's all the time we we have. We have a lot more questions, but. Um, we have to to end this webinar. I'd like to thank you, Dr. Hanley, for uh, for your presentation and for answering uh, the questions uh, from the participants. Uh, in uh, in closing, uh, uh, we would greatly appreciate your feedback to improve our um, future events. So please take a few minutes. To complete the survey below the video, uh, you may also uh, print a certificate of attendance for your personal records. And uh, if you are interested in staying uh, informed about our upcoming webinars or be kept up to date on uh, the latest research with regards to milk products, I invite you to subscribe to our uh, new Nutri News newsletter on the top uh, right of the page. So on behalf of uh, Dairy Farmers of Canada, thank you very much for your participation and uh, I wish you a good end of the day.